Welcome everyone, Facebook, YouTube, congregation, praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together today as a family once again. Um, we've all had to endure the fear, the uncertainty, at whatever level of faith we're working with. And it's, it's, it looks like it's, things are getting better. And I just praise God for the opportunity to come together as a family again in person and, uh, and to get on with praising God and rejoicing about God and just letting go and letting God handle what he needs to do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to wake up this morning. We thank you for the gift of life, Lord God. And above all, we thank you for the blood of Jesus the sanctifying, cleansing blood of Jesus that has redeemed us, Heavenly Father, and brought us back into your family. We thank you for this privilege, Lord God, to be called sons and daughters once again. And we look to you now, Lord God, for everything. We thank you, Lord, for every single blessing that you've given us, knowing that it's through your grace that we receive these blessings. And the only thing we can give to you of any work that you will receive is our faith. So let us place that faith in the one place where you will receive it from. And that's in the precious blood of Jesus and what he did for all of us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, and we rejoice in your name. And let us put on our praise garment and praise you without any, any forever, Lord God. Just continue to praise you continually. For all the blessings that you've given us, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I'll tell you, if there's anything that's in your heart, any feeling that is oppressing your mind, the one thing you can do to get rid of it is just rejoice in the Lord and praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's in the rejoicing and the praising of God that we do the one thing that Jesus told us we wanted to do, if in fact we were to follow him. Luke 9, 23, 24. He said, deny yourself. Mm. It's the preoccupation with self which causes all the problems as believers that we find befall us today. The preoccupation with self which leads to self-centeredness and selfishness. It's all of the flesh and it's not of God. And it's controlled by the devil. It's used by the devil to keep us rooted in his world and vulnerable to his tactics and his will. And it creates all the havoc that we have today. Because if we're in the self, we are now influenced by the sin nature of the flesh. And you have actually two choices. We all have two choices. We can either be in ourself, in sin, or we can choose to rest in Christ and find the love by walking in the likeness of Christ and share that love with everyone we come into contact with. Let me begin today with the scripture, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. Uh, Pastor Tony asked me about the, the title for the sermon today, that the title I gave him was Betrayal. Because I want us to talk about betrayal. Because I think we have all felt at one time betrayed in our lives. Mm. And make no mistake about it, we have other people who we've come into contact with who feel as though we have betrayed them. Mm. And maybe we did, maybe we didn't. But the one thing is clear. One's perception is one's reality. Right. The lens they choose to look through is the their reality. That's their truth. Mm -hmm. And they feel as though you betrayed them, and in their world you did. And there's nothing you can do to take back what they perceived you did. That is, it's gone. It's, it's over with. But we'll come back to that later. Mm -hmm. So he came to Nazareth. This was the hometown of Jesus. This was where he was born. And he had been brought up, oh, I'm glad the scripture said that, I didn't have to go into that. Where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, Jesus, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. 
and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Holy Spirit, upon Jesus. Let us remember, he came as a man in the flesh. God sent his own Son in the flesh. Okay? Because he has anointed me. He had the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that allowed Jesus to perform all the miracles. But he was still a man without sin. That's what made him the perfect sacrifice. To preach the gospel to the poor. The gospel, the good news. The gospel that Jesus brought to us was the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel of Christ. And he has sent me to heal the broken heart. The problem is sin. When we sin, we break our hearts. To proclaim liberty to the captives. We're all under the control of sin before we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Sin has dominion over us. We are in bondage. We are in captivity. To proclaim liberty to the captives and to recover the sight of the blind. It's a spiritual blindness that we find ourselves in. And set at liberty those who are oppressed. Demonic forces, demonic spirits, they oppress our mind. They control our thinking. I will tell you right now, when we are thinking, we are in the flesh. And we are under the attack of the devil. The mind is the battlefield of the devil, the spiritual warfare. If you are thinking, you are actually at risk for attack and oppression of the devil. Mm. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The year, of the year of Jubilee. Actually, this was at the beginning of the year of Jubilee, which to the Christian denotes the forgiveness of sins. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, mm. proclaiming he was the Christ. You know, it's, it's very interesting, the fact that the learned scholars of the uh, Bible, or at that time the Torah, where we have all the prophecies of the prophets depicting the coming of Jesus, that with all this knowledge, they would reject the Messiah when he was there right in front of them. Here was the man who came not to hurt anyone. He had performed all those miracles. He healed all the sick. He spoke words of wisdom. He healed people's broken hearts. Everyone who came into contact with him felt his love. But yet, they saw it fit to reject him and even accused him of actually his miracles being caused by Baal and demonic spirits. They blasphemed, blasphemed the Holy Spirit which is the unforgivable, unforgivable sin. They did all of this because of their own selfishness, their wickedness, their darkness. But yet, Jesus was able to forgive them. If anyone had the reason to feel betrayed, if anyone had a reason to act out, on their disappointment, if anyone, you know, was ever to show us how we should respond when we feel as though we're being betrayed, it was Jesus Christ. Mm. And what he showed us was, what he taught us was, the only way to deal with betrayal and the hurt and the pain and whatever suffering you think it's caused you, the flesh will tell you, rid yourself of this person separate yourself from the person and be done with him. Reject him. But Jesus says, not so. Jesus said the course that we must follow is to forgive. 
Without forgiveness, we have undermined the basic principle of Christianity and Christian life. Mm -hmm. If we cannot forgive, we will stay rooted in our flesh. Mm -hmm. And we will miss the whole point of what Jesus has brought to us. He brought the love of God and agape love to us, to a people who did not deserve it. It was a gift of God. Not something we earned. Not something we could claim on our own merit. It is a gift of God. This forgiveness, this thing we call grace, and it was responsible for every blessing that we had. And we did nothing to deserve it. And there's nothing of our flesh, of our own will, of our own works that we can take to God and he will receive. And unfortunately, the modern church is all caught up in the works of the flesh, the merit of man. And all that does is just create a sense of self-righteousness, which allows you to judge your neighbor, judge your offender, and take the, the, the pompous position of self-righteousness and say, they're wrong, I'm right, you get away from me until you agree with what, I, what it is I'm saying. Or you apologize to me. There is no apology needed. The problem is sin. And if we're sinning, the confession goes to God. And if you have a repentant heart, you will be sorry for the grief that you called God because in spite of all the things and sacrifices that he did for us, here you are grieving him and just not being obedient. Well, yes, our sense of self and our will has a problem with obedience. Common man has become so intelligent, so self-sufficient, that he feels as though, why should I be obedient to a God? They reject God. And then they think of all the things that this God does that they don't like. Justifying their rejection and their need not to necessarily be obedient to this God. They become their own God, their own God, their own idol. But I will tell you this. Every man and woman in this room, every man and woman looking at this, this sermon or listening to it, You'll be a slave to one of two things. You'll either be a slave to God through Jesus, or you'll be a slave to the devil and wickedness. There is no middle ground. No middle ground. And depending on the choice that you make, when you die, and your soul and spirit go to one place, there's only two choices. There's either heaven or hell. That's right. And hell is a place of so much agony and despair, it's unimaginable. But the most alarming thing about hell is it's forever. Mm -hmm. There is no end. We can suffer here on earth, but there's an ending. Eventually. But with hell, there is no end. It's forever. It's eternal. Think about that. We need to really think about that. And why should I fear God? Because God is the judge that determines where you go. That's why you should fear God. And who is God? He is the creator of all things. He created you. He created this cosmos. He created the world. He created everything. And if you don't think there's a creator and there's a God, then you are surely blind. I go to Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. We all know the gospel of Christ. There was the gospel that Jesus brought, the good news, the kingdom of God is at hand. He paid the price for all of our sins. He became the perfect sacrifice for all sin forever. And those who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior 
and believe that God raised him from the dead, which is our victory over death, they are now saved. And they become a born again, born of the Spirit, believer, saint in God. Hallelujah. And we are back in the family of God. And the gospel of Christ is a very simple thing. In fact, sometimes we become so intelligent we won't accept the simplicity of things. But know this, the gospel of Christ is very, very, very simple. And Apostle Paul says that Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. No. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to, thus, but to those who are saved, it is the power of God. He knew that if he used words of wisdom, the cross of Christ would be made of no effect. Because it's a very simple thing. It's based on one premise and one premise alone. We are sinners. We are sinners, all of us. I am a worthless sinner until I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit now gives me the authority to say these things. Not the man I was before, oh, he was wretched. But the man I am today, the new creation through the blood of Jesus, I can tell you now with authority and preach these things to you. But the problem is there's many, many false teachings in the modern church now. It's a generational problem ever since the early church and the first one to two hundred years of the early church. After that, it essentially went all downhill with false teachings. Apostle Paul would talk about it. He said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I fear least somehow as the serpent deceived thee by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This message of the cross is very simple. All it says is, when you become born again, do you know, Romans chapter 6, verses 3, 4, and 5, do you know that all who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so all of us born-again believers should walk in the newness of life. Because We've been united with Christ in the likeness of his death. If we have, in fact, that has happened, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We're that new creation born in the likeness of Christ. That's why Apostle Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I have determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's a very simple concept. What happens is you die. And now you become spiritually alive. And it's only through the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we can affect the healing and the sanctification that actually heals us and allows us to live the regenerated and the victorious life. And walk in the spirit and the likeness of Christ. But we have to die to ourselves. We have to deny ourselves. We have to crucify the flesh daily. If we don't, we're back in the flesh. The sin nature is now in control of us. And we're committing what we call spiritual adultery. When we go to Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law. Through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another. To him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. 
But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. God brought the law to man to expose that he was a sinner, to show him righteousness and holiness, and that he could not keep the law on his own merit, his own will. So Jesus came, became a substitute for our sin debt, paid the price on the cross, gave us victory over death, freed us from the dominion of sin, and now we are part of the family of God. Amen. However, in our minds, we read in Romans chapter, at the end of chapter 7, the beginning of chapter 8, with our mind we want to serve God. With our will, our desire is to serve God. But there's a stronger force inside of us. The sin nature residing in the flesh. Mm -hmm. So we serve the law of God with our mind, but with the flesh we serve the sin nature. And that's stronger than the law in our mind. What are we going to do? Who's going to save us? Jesus saved us. Thank God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For, therefore, therefore, it says in verse, chapter 8, verse 1, if we are in Christ and we do not walk in the flesh but in the Spirit, now the spirit of life in Christ has freed us from the spirit of, or the law of sin and death. That's what's happened. That's how we remain free. For what the law, the Ten Commandments, could not do in and of itself, because of the weakness of our flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk in the flesh, but in the spirit. So when we speak about being betrayed and we, and we identify with the feelings of hurt and pain from being betrayed, I'll spin this around and show you how it works. When my wife was diagnosed, not diagnosed, she's not even diagnosed, someone gave an opinion that it looked like it was cancer. Whew. A man of God in the spirit at that moment, scripture tells us, thank God, be joyful when various trials come into your life. And I know why we should be joyful. They're there to teach us a lesson, to show us something that we need to do, a change we need to make. We're too reliant on ourself and our way of the self. There's something we need to change to draw closer to Him. And sometimes, and it, we don't change unless something happens. Something has to push us mm -hmm. to change, or we'll just stay rooted in that habit. Yeah. And so when that happens, I thought about, wow, my wife, the love of my life, the soulmate God sent me. I could lose this. I could lose it. And really what I thought at that moment was, you know something, I really haven't treated my wife the way she should have been treated. <coughs> And at that moment, the Spirit came upon me, and it said, you know, you hear these things approach every day as if it were the last day of your life. And I said to the Lord, I confess the sin of not loving my wife the way Jesus loved me. And I repented. I was sorry. But I made a vow to make sure that I treated my wife every day 
as if it was the last day I would see it. Now I've already claimed the victory, and I had claimed it before. She doesn't have cancer. I'm sorry. I claim that victory right now. I know it in my heart and soul she doesn't have. But I know that this happened for a reason to open my eyes. Because I have betrayed her love for me. Because I didn't even meet her halfway, I doubt, but when I think about it. And she could have stepped away and walked away and been like the others. But when you marry a godly woman, she'll stick there with you because she's not looking at you, she's looking at Jesus. And she's not being self-centered, she's being Christ-centered. And that's what I'm talking about. So she being a Christ-centered woman, dealt with it. And where did she take it? She took it to the cross. So now, I've made that transition. Because instead of looking through the lenses of Greg two days ago, I'm looking through the lenses of Jesus. I've hit that Gilgal. I've rolled away on the past and taken advantage of this new opportunity. I've seen what the Lord, and I took it to the Lord. What is it you want me to learn from this? Because this isn't punishment. This isn't woe is me. What is this about? Oh yeah, I've seen that. This is about me. And make no mistake, when you're pointing the finger and you're standing in judgment because of something that happened in your life, well, yeah, God signed off on it. He might have even caused it. But guess what? It ain't about them. You always make it towards them. But in reality, it's about you. It's all about you. And what are you going to do? So I have this light. And the light shined upon me. And I've made a vow. And it, it, the Spirit just went into my heart and did a major repair job, like one of those overnight construction jobs where you see a bunch of people out there fixing the road, and then you wake up the next morning, boom, there it is, Woo! It was like that. <laughs> In fact, it was even faster. Because the Lord purifies the heart. That's the sanctification process. So I took this vow, you see, and I realized over the next few days, you know, something changed, you know. I don't know if married men out there, and I'm speaking to y'all married men out here, you know, because we can, men can be very selfish, mm -hmm. okay? And that's just a fact. If you don't admit that, then you're not a man. And I realized, you know what? Love my wife, don't get me wrong. And I'm sure there's many men out here that love your wives, but I noticed the old man, there were certain times my wife would do things that just get on my nerves. <laughs> you know, little man, she might be standing in my way, in my egress, and I'm trying to move, and she's just standing there, and I'm like, I'm trying to do my thing here. Can you, you know, move aside? Come on. <laughs> in my flesh, in my head, doing my thing, like Tony, Pastor Tony, I'm thinking about what I got to do, how I'm going to do it, all these other things in the flesh, out of the spirit. But I realize now, and with this other thing, you realize that we are powerless. That there's no plan. You talk about, you know, we hope we have the right doctor, etc. We don't have the right doctor, and we're going to go to the right place. Because the Lord's already worked to prepare that for us. We called our primary care doctor, one of the things we did, and he called us back about three days later, and he's got the whole thing laid out. And you know what that man said to me? He said to my wife, he, she said, he said, I'm the primary care doctor, I'm the quarterback. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is my job. And that spoke to me as a doctor. You know? He said, I look forward to this opportunity. You sit back, and I'm going to fix it for you. I'm going to find out exactly everything that you need to do. Some people might say, well, why didn't he know right away? Well, you don't always know right away. Everybody says you've got to do your research. He's a Christian. Maybe you have to pray on it some more. But the Lord found the way, and we don't have to do anything but sit back. The Lord has the answer. He always has the answer. We don't have to micromanage this thing. But getting back to my point, I've noticed over the past few days, the little things that used to annoy me, they don't even, that's not even a thought with me now. I, when I look at my wife now, every little thing she does brings me joy to see it. It's her uniqueness. 
It's her beauty. It's the special things that make her who she is, the person God created her to be. And I just see beauty in it all. And that's a beautiful state of mind to be in. It's a beautiful lens to have. And when someone betrays me, I realize in this state of newness of love, agape love, because I'm in the newness of Christ, walking in the likeness of Christ, you can't really hurt me. You can't really offend me. Or if you do, it's okay. Because I'm not going to judge you. Who am I? To judge anyone. I am not, I have no privilege, no right to judge anyone of anything that I believe they're doing wrong. I can look at it and see it's wrong, but I'm not going to judge you about it. All I can do is forgive you. If you don't have forgiveness in your life, I guarantee you, you will not have joy, you will not have peace. And you will not have the love of God in your heart. It's impossible. It all starts with forgiveness of our fellow man. And that's what's missing in this country. Amen. Amen. We can't help people whose reaction to whatever it is they're going through is not the best course of action. We can't help them with anything but to pray for them. And yeah, let the law do what it's got to do. We can't change people's behavior. We really can't. We can legislate all we want, but legislation is not going to fix these problems we have. Well, you can't force anybody to love someone. All you can do is model yourself what it is you want them to do, which is to walk in the newness of Christ and have faith. Because I'm telling you, once you learn to deny yourself, that Holy Spirit will rise up inside of you and will take over and will heal everything inside of you. And you will have that joy and that peace. And as soon as you go into your mind and start thinking, you are back in the flesh, open to attacks from the devil, oppression of your mind by the devil, you're not in the spirit, and you can't please God. As right in Romans chapter 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, period. So, in ending, I don't care what you're going through, and when you get in that flesh, there's only one simple thing we can do. Whatever it is, you only have one place to go. And that's at the cross, at the feet of Jesus. If you need forgiveness and repentance, take it to the cross. If you need comfort and consoling, take it to the cross. If you need strength, Take it to the cross. Jesus already showed us. He is the only one who can help us. So you need to rest in him. Take whatever you have to the cross. And know that the victory Jesus had in the cross solved every problem for us. Because it defeated sin forever. So you take it to the cross, you put your faith in what he did, and you rest from yourself, and you walk in that spirit. That is our only hope. It is our only hope. And yes, we know Jesus is coming. Why is he coming? Because we can't fix this world. We can't fix it. It's unfixable. But what we can do during these latter days, we can model Christ. 
and take this message of the cross to the people. Because I dare say only a very small fraction of the modern church understands it and is using it. And we can take this message to the people so they can rise up and learn how to truly model Christ and walk in the newness of Christ so we can bring more people into the family of God. That's the only reason we're here. Is to increase and build the kingdom of God which now is inside every believer who's in the spirit. That's where the kingdom is. And it's going to be realized in its entirety when Jesus comes. Somebody told me they wanted to go to Jerusalem. They couldn't go. Brother Frank, he lost out on it because somebody wouldn't allow him to go. I said, Frank, I'm not trying to go to Jerusalem in this lifetime. I'm going to Jerusalem, okay, in the cloud with Jesus. <laughs> That's what I'm going to Jerusalem. I have no real desire to go there now. I want to go with Jesus. That's what I'm going to Jerusalem. I thank you all for listening to me. I praise God and, and, and I just love the Lord so much. I love all of you too. Have a great day. Have a blessed day. I hope this word helped you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen.